Welcome to the third video in our series on joint and byproduct costing. In this video, we're going to look at the second of our four methods of allocating the joint costs, namely the sales value at split off point method. In this video, we will begin by revising the basic idea behind joint and byproduct costing. We will then understand the key ideas behind the sales value at split off point method. Once we have understood these key ideas, we will then look at a practical example in which we allocate the joint costs to the joint products. From this example, we will see the advantages and disadvantages of the sales value at split off point method and conclude by discussing under what circumstances this method is suitable. Let us revise the idea behind joint and bar products. As with any other manufacturing process, we take our raw materials, labor, and overheads, and we subject them to a manufacturing process in order to get out a product at the end. However, unlike a single product process, we could get out two or three or even more products simultaneously from the process. For joint processes, we cannot distinguish between the different products until a specific point known as a split-off point. Before the split-off point, we cannot trace the costs to the individual products. Finally, after the split-off point, where the products are separately identifiable, the products may be subject to further processing. These further processing costs can be traced to the individual products to which they relate. So what is the sales value at split off point method all about? The key idea behind this method is that the joint costs are allocated to the joint products based on their sales value at the split off point. So remember, this is the point where the products become separately identifiable for the first time. It is important to note that we are not splitting the joint costs based on their per unit selling price but rather the total sales value of all the units produced in the process. The assumption underlying this method is that higher selling prices indicate higher costs. Thus, we expect the joint products with higher total sales value to be allocated more of the joint cost. Let us use a small example to see how the sales value at split off point works. You should recognize this example from our previous video. We have a company called Joint that produces three products in a joint process. The total joint costs amount to 400,000 Rand. Notice that we have already deducted the net realizable value of any bar products in arriving at this 400,000 Rand. Always remember to adjust the joint costs for any bar products, scrap and waste before allocating the joint costs to the joint products. We are then given details of the three products at the split of point when they become separately identifiable. We are given the output in units, the sales value per unit at the split of point, any further processing costs, and then a final sales value after further processing has taken place. Now remember, the key idea behind the sales value at split of point method is that we allocate the joint costs based on the total sales revenue at the split of point. Therefore, in this information, we are only concerned about the output and the sales value at the split of point. We can ignore the rest of the information. So if we have a look at this table, we can fill in the information we already have. We already know the units produced for each joint product, the sales value at split of point per unit, and the total joint costs to be allocated. These were given to us in the question, so we can fill them in. What we now need to do is calculate the joint costs allocated to each product. To do this, we first need to calculate the total sales value at the split off point for each product. Here, we simply take the number of units produced presented in the first column and multiply it by the sales value at the split off point in the second column. If we total these, we then arrive at the total sales value at the split off point of 500,000 Rand. We can now use this total sales value to calculate the proportions in which the joint costs should be split. 
So considering product A, we see that it represents 225,000 Rand out of our total sales of 500,000 Rand. 225,000 Rand divided by 500,000 Rand represents 45%. Likewise, product B represents 160,000 Rand out of the total sales value of 500,000 Rand. 160,000 Rand divided by 500,000 Rand represents 32% of total sales. Finally, product C represents 115,000 Rand of the total sales at split of point of 500,000 Rand. 115,000 Rand divided by 500,000 Rand represents 23%. We now have the proportion of each product sales to the total sales at the split of point of the joint process. To calculate the joint costs allocated to each product, we simply take the total joint costs of 400,000 Rand and multiply it by each product's proportion of sales value at the split of point. So for product A, we take the 400,000 Rand and multiply it by the proportion of 45% to get an allocation of 180,000 Rand. For product B, we take the 400,000 Rand and multiply it by the proportion of 32% to get an allocation of 128,000 Rand. Finally, for product C, we take the 400,000 Rand and multiply it by the proportion of 23% to get 92,000 Rand. We now have our joint cost allocation for each product. To calculate the joint cost per unit, we take the allocated joint cost and divide it by the number of units produced. So for product A, we take 180,000 Rand divided by 15,000 units to get 12 Rand per unit. We do the same for product B and product C, and we get 6 Rand and 40 cents and 18 Rand and 40 cents respectively. Now you should notice a difference between the sales value at split of point method compared to the physical measures method we used in our previous video. Unlike the physical measures method, you will notice that the joint cost per unit is lower than the sales value at the split of point. So we don't have the problem of writing down our inventory to the net realizable value. Given what we have seen, let us consider the suitability of the sales value at split of point method. If we look at the advantages of the sales value at split of point method, we see that it addresses the problems we encountered during the physical measures method. The sales value at split of method can be used when we have outputs that are measured in different forms, such as liters or kilograms. And secondly, our inventory will be correctly valued so that we don't need to write it down to the net realizable value. However, the method does have some disadvantages. First, the sales value at the split of point is not always readily available if there is no market for the intermediary product. Second, the underlying assumption that there is a set relationship between cost and sales price is invalid. Something you may want to think about now is what does determine the selling price. So given these issues, we need to ask when is the sales value at split of point method suitable? It is suitable when the sales value at the split of point is available and the assumption of a relationship between the sales price and the cost is logical and true. This brings us to the end of the sales value at split of point method. Join us in our next video where we will look at the net realizable value method.